Well, Claire, thank you very much indeed for reading for us, and I add my welcome to Paul's. It's lovely to see lots of uh, for old friends returning to visit us, and a very warm welcome to you if that's you or a first-time visitor. We're delighted to see you with us. Now, our subject this morning isn't at all hard for us to spot. You can see it that dominates both today's passage in Ephesians and indeed uh, the whole of the rest of the letter. It has to do with Christian conduct. Uh, More specifically, this morning we are looking at what you might call our lips and the way we use our language, our emotions and the way we deal with our temper and our anger, and our approach to one another, our kindness, tenderness, generosity, and love. And really, this second half of Paul's letter to the Ephesians could not be more practical. And you will notice that the reading, as we just had it read to us by Claire, is impregnated with imperatives. Verse 25, let each of you speak the truth. Verse 26, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal. Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Right up front, however, uh, I need to point out that this focus on Christian conduct is a million miles away from the sort of moralizing lecture that we might expect to receive from perhaps the St. Paul's Institute or the headmaster at the school's assembly. Very easy to come to a passage like this and jump straight into the imperatives without devoting significant time to what I like to call the engine that is designed to drive Christian conduct. And when we do that, we descend simply into a moralizing lecture. There is no power to affect the change. And you then have to end up introducing increasingly harsh and barbaric legislation to enforce it, that is a million miles away from genuine Christianity. So always when I come to a passage like this, I'm asking myself, where is the engine? Where's the drive? What is it that is motivating and enabling this change? And all through the first half of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul has devoted himself to explaining what it is that God has done in the Christian to make real change possible. It seems then that Paul is determined that we should grasp what it is God has accomplished. Twice he says to the Ephesian readers that he wants them to know the full extent of God's power at work within them, what it is that God has done, so that, indeed, they can then act differently. In Jesus, God has defeated sin and death on the cross and through the resurrection of Jesus. In Jesus, God has triumphed over all evil powers. Jesus is now seated, enthroned at the right hand of God, in eternity, we see in Jesus a new humanity full of goodness and truth and purity and righteousness and a new humanity that has triumphed over the old way of sin and death and decay. And therefore in Jesus we see that God has raised his people, those in whom he has started a work, his Christian believers, has raised these people to new life. And in Jesus, God purposes to bring all things in heaven and on earth under his rule. So in the first half of the letter, we're told that God's purpose is that in the church today, you and I, we Christians, should put on what he has accomplished in Christ so that what God has done is then blazoned across the world for all powers and authorities, earthly and heavenly, to see what it is that God is doing. Just look across your page there to chapter 3 
and verses 9 and 10. It is God's purpose to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So Paul now constantly reminds us of the first half of the letter in the second half of the letter. And just as our chapters are impregnated with imperatives, so you might say they are studded with references to what God has already achieved in Christ. So that this isn't just a sort of moralizing lecture, pull your socks up, try harder, you in the lower fourths have not done terribly well, and we all need to do a little bit better. Rather, we are to put on the new self. And as we put on the new self, trusting in what God has done, so we are to advertise God's great work across the world. And no, it's no more clearly seen than in the language of put off and put on that you will see there in verse 22 and 24. Put off your old self, put on the new self. So today you might say we're in the world of the Westfield Shopping Center and we're in the changing rooms and we're being urged to put on a new garment created for us. Here is the old, worn, scruffy, battered, tarnished self. And here is this glorious new bespoke self created perfectly, tailored by God himself. And Paul is saying, put off the old, put on the new. And this image uh, avoids for us two dangers. Paul neither urges us simply to pull our socks up, as if Christian conduct were a matter of turning over a new light leaf and trying a little bit harder, as if fallen humanity can ever lift itself out of the sewer, but at the same time, Paul does not descend into the realm of Dylan from the Magic Roundabout or Timon and Pumbaa in The Lion King, Akuna Matata. God has done it all. Let's lie back on the lilo of the Christian life and let it all happen. No, he says, put off, put on. We are to work. There is real energetic activity here. And it's not just a kind of no worries, mate, attitude to the Christian life. Well, let's look at the way this is unfolded for us in the passage. First, the radical change that God has worked, walk in it. Verses 17 to 24 contain for us a graphic image of before and after. And 17 to 19 describes the old me. And 20 to 24 the new creation. It is classic before and after. Here is Jasper before he discovered Humphrey's hair lotion. Hair all over the place. And here is Jasper afterwards, before and after. Verse 17. The Gentile is the non-Christian, the pagan. And you will notice that the change has been wrought in the sphere of the mind. Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Verse 18, their minds are darkened. Verse 20, the Christian has learned Christ. And verse 23, the Christian is renewed in the spirit of his mind. The mind is far more than simply an intellectual thing. The Bible has the mind as the organ of our moral reasoning. The mind is where we take our decisions, how we decide on what principles we will live by, what values form the basis of our conduct. So Paul is not suggesting here that the non-Christian person is somehow stupid or intellectually flawed. Rather, he is saying that the non-Christian mind is darkened, cut off from God, ignorant, hardened, calloused. 
And the language of verses 17 to 19 is incredibly strong, isn't it? I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The mind is the real me, where I make my decisions, decide what I will live by. And Paul says the real me without Jesus is a dark place. Futile, inevitably, because as I cease to locate my existence with ref without reference to the purity of God and the goodness of my eternal creator, everything is ultimately, ultimately meaningless. Ignorant, of course, because of my hardness of heart towards God, so I am alienated from God, cut off from my creator, and therefore can know nothing of God. Callous, yes, because our moral thinking cut off from God becomes increasingly hardened, like the rower's hands, calloused against God, and increasingly on a trajectory of moral decline. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, of course, it doesn't happen all at once. There is no sudden lurch in a culture towards immorality of this sort. There is rather a gradual, gradual, almost imperceptible, steady decline into moral depravity. And therefore, when the celebrity atheist and the strident secularist, pers secularist persuades their disciples that abandoning all notion of the God of the Bible is a morally neutral affair, their proselytizing zeal will ultimately have its impact in behavior. To become ignorant of God through the hardness of my heart will change my behavior. And the logic of that, I think, is inescapable in this passage, and the evidence in our culture today is unavoidable. The logic that the good, pure, morally perfect, holy, loving God stands outside of our creation, gives us life and health and everything that we have. As we are alienated from him, we are left only to ourselves within the bubble of this limited existence. And therefore, we can only set our moral compass, alienated from God, by what we consider to be right. Cut off from God, calloused against God, what we consider to be right, if you like, in the cage, adrift from God, will only ever be fixed by what we think works, what we think is useful. And fascinatingly, the uh, the celebrity atheists are engaging in this debate at the moment. You may have come across Sam Harris, who you certainly will shortly, a um, neuroscientist who is arguing that we can now look to science to tell us what is good. What is good, according to Sam Harris, oh, what is good is what produces human well-being. Who decides what produces human well-being? Oh, the scientist. But without any pure, holy, perfect, ultimate, absolute being breaking in to tell us what is good, the scientist's description of what is good and what produces human well-being will always be limited to just what, just what the scientist can understand. And so we are back into utilitarian morality. And ultimately, whoever has the most power will decide what is good the men and women we are remembering today who gave their lives, fought to prevent that sort of utilitarian morality taking hold of Europe. There's the logic. The evidence of it, of course, is everywhere. That cut off from God inevitably 
we descend into sensuality and a continual lust for more. Just look at the evidence of it in our own culture. Alienated from the good and pure and perfect goodness of God, we have as a culture drifted on a downward trajectory. Uh, we're looking at the area and sphere of language and our lips. Do you know, in the first 10 years of the 20th century, Eliza Doolittle broke onto the London stage, and in Pygmalion, my fair lady, uttered the immortal words, not be likely. There was utter uproar. Complete uproar. If you, unless you're totally ignorant of history of our culture, of course, we, uh, you'll be aware of that. In the sphere of truth, we're looking at language on our lips. Um, just, uh, I used to run a small group for senior bankers on a Monday lunchtime. I remember one of them saying to me, when he started in the city in 1979, you could pick up the telephone and lend a million pounds over the telephone, expecting the paperwork to finish, in the, to, to follow in the next week or two. Your re word really was your bond in the city. A million pounds was a lot of money. But as we cut ourselves off from God as a culture, so we plunge into relative morality and a downward decline in the area of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. Consider the demise of the times. Once upon a time, a bastion of reverence, decency, and uprightness. Today, it leads the charge towards moral depravity. Now, we haven't even touched on Westminster and the Metropolitan Police, football, cricket, sport, and so on. The pagan mind is a dark place. It's a gradual thing. But cut off from God without any Thing, anyone from outside to break in and change us. Alienated from God, callous, increasingly hardened, giving ourselves over to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And every single person born into this world, everyone here, has at one stage been part of that world or is still part of that world if there has not been a new creation from God, the past. But in verses 20 to 24, Paul speaks of what the Christian person has no, now become. And I want us to notice that what has happened is something that has been done in us. So look at verse 23 and notice the mood. I think it's called the mood of the verb in verse 23. It is a passive. You are being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Look at the tense. It is present continuous. This is something that God is doing in the Christian. He has broken into the Christian person's life, has brought new life, and now by his Holy Spirit is renewing the Christian person in the spirit of their minds. And now look at the language of verse 24. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holy, holiness. So the initiative is from God. The incentive is of grace. God has done everything necessary for me to be recreated. A new self, one new humanity in and through Jesus and joined to Jesus by his Holy Spirit now at work within me, Paul says, put on the new self. Be what you have become. Now, I love this. There is a, a, a perfect symmetry here. To the Christian person who says, but I've tried and tried and tried and tried with my language, my temper, my attitude towards others. I've tried, I've tried. You've no idea how hard I've tried. Paul said, look, it's not all about me and my effort. God is at work in you. He has created one new humanity in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So turn to God and trust him. Put off the old self. Put on the new. He has done everything necessary. He has recreated me and is now at work in me, within my mind, to change me into the new self. To the Christian person who says, but I'm so rotten, you've no idea of the base from which I'm starting. It's all right for X, Y, or Z sitting around me. They came from a different kind of home to me. They have a different childhood experience to me. Paul says, I've every idea how rotten you are. You were darkened in the spirit of your minds. You were futile in your thinking. You were cut off from God. You were calloused and on a, a trajectory into sensuality, but God has broken in and changed things and done everything necessary, defeating sin, risen to the right hand of God, creating in you a new humanity, a new person. But then to the person who says, well, I've got a new mind, I'm waiting for God to do it in me, I'm just sitting in my study, hoping that God will actually affect this change, Paul says, no, put it on. Walk in it. Do something. Act. Use all your own strength, energized and enabled by God. Notice again, as we track back through verse 20 to 23, the place of the mind. And I think this explains how God is at work within us. Verse 20 and 21 are fascinating. They describe how a person becomes a Christian. This is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Isn't it strange to learn a person, to be taught a person to learn a relationship. It's not so much Christianity explored as Jesus taught. But Paul's intention is not that we learn Jesus, cross the threshold, and then graduate from the school of Christ, never to go back into school again. There is a a continuous learning of Christ going on here. So that as we come back to Jesus, and back to Jesus, and back to Jesus... So we are being renewed in the spirit of our mind. Putting off the old and putting on the new self. Ongoing Christian growth, genuine Christian change, life-changing Christian conduct comes as we learn Christ. And so that old hackneyed phrase, what would Jesus do, though we might think it is horribly quiche, and rather twee, is not actually such a bad phrase. I I was at a Christian conference center earlier this summer, and I saw a book called What Would Jesus Eat? I have to say, I I thought that is perhaps pushing things a little bit bit far. I I, I guess Jesus would eat all sorts of things. We, we, We would never touch these days, but there we go. We won't go into that. But that old phrase, what would Jesus do, is not such a bad thing. He has created in Jesus a whole new humanity. He's Shown in Jesus, this world with all its decay and moral futility and downward spiral has been conquered. He has raised Jesus to the right hand of God and ultimately all things will be brought under the rule of Christ. Now by his Holy Spirit he has entered into you if you're a Christian and brought you alive out of your futile way of life. Working a radical change. And so as I look to the new humanity, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask myself... Yes, how does he react in this situation? What does it look like to be the new me? Who am I now? So, as my mind is renewed, real Christian conduct is enabled. But it requires real effort. And we must be careful that we don't say, well, I won't do it in my own strength, I'll lie back and wait for it to happen. That in doing that, we don't say, no worries, mate. Put off. Put on. You see how radically different this is for legislating for Christian conduct or for bullying people into Christian conduct. It's driven by the work of God. Uh, We began in Westfield. 
I wonder perhaps whether we shouldn't really have begun in the Goring Hotel on the morning of Monday, so, well, sorry, the 29th of April. Was it a Monday? I think it might have been. I can't remember. Was it a Friday? Who cares? Um, well, two people do, but I can't remember. We should perhaps have been in the Goring Hotel on the morning of the 29th. Here is the commoner Kate with her ma mother, Carol. And here is the glorious garment designed by Sarah Burton for the world to see in this great royal occasion. No doubt wrapped around some mannequin or other. And as she puts it on, removes the old, puts on the new, so her whole identity is transformed. Here we are in the drab, worn, soiled, stained garments of our pagan life, pre-Christian, futile in our thinking, morally flawed, stained with a lifetime of callous indifference to God on a downward spiral with the rest of the pagan culture. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ. As he enters into our life by his Holy Spirit, so we are a new creation. And now, says Paul, look, put this on, this new self created in Christ Jesus after pure righteousness and holiness. Well, in the last five minutes, we're going to begin to touch on some of the practical outworkings, and we will be coming back to them week after week after week. The radical change that God has wrought, walk in it. The reformed character that Christ has enabled, put it on. Verse 25 and 29 are language. Verse 26 and 31 are emotions. Verse 28 and 32 through to 5, 2 are love, kindness, gentleness, and generosity. Even here, you can't escape Paul's constant reference back to what God has done. He speaks of anger, give no opportunity to the devil. He speaks of language, do not grieve the spirit. He speaks of love, gentleness, and kindness, imitate God. So all the time, he's referencing back ourselves back to what God has done in Christ. Spiritual warfare, then, giving no opportunity to the devil, it has little to do with weird and wonderful spiritual experiences. It has a huge amount to do with keeping my temper, giving my money, telling the truth, imitating God. First, lip and language. Verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. We are to speak the truth to one another as a Christian community because we are now members of one another. God has brought us together in and through his Holy Spirit. We are not to grieve the Spirit who indwells each one of us by lying to one another and using our lip and language to tear one another down. To conceal the truth from my Christian brother or sister is to grieve God's Holy Spirit, who lives in us both. We are members now, one of another. How could we ever seek to tear down and to drive apart what God has brought together? There is then, in the way we speak with one another, to be a genuine self-conscious consideration of our new identity. I, I saw a particular illustration of this this week a group of men talking about a particular individual. The conversation turned ever so slightly in the direction of the, oh, he's a good bloke, but... And one person in the group quietly got up, walked away to get a cup of coffee somewhere, engaged someone else in conversation, and just quietly withdrew. Not holier than thou, not great song and dance, just I will not grieve the Holy Spirit by talking about a Christian brother like that. 
I, I'm a member, one of another. I, I, I will not engage in that sort of conversation. God the Holy Spirit dwells in me. God the Holy Spirit dwells in him. I will not use my language to tear down what God has put together. And that is to be reflected across the whole of the Christian community. Oh, we can expect the world to use their lip to tear down. We can expect gossip and slander in the world because their futile minds are darkened. The pagan, non-Christian, has no reference point other than himself and those around him. There is no work of God going on in their life. And therefore, you can expect the world to descend into gossip and slander, whether it's the times or whatever it happens to be. I came down from Cambridge yesterday evening. I was speaking up there and uh, happened to pick up in, in, in the... Uh, train a, a, a copy of a magazine called New. I don't, I don't, I've never ever come across New before. Probably you all take it. Uh, I, I don't know. But uh, um, I was absolutely staggered. It, it's a sort of weekly chart of what's going on in the X Factor, Strictly Come Dancing and all the rest of it. And just the sort of rank, pagan, tearing apart of the whole thing was mind-blowing. Gossip, slander, backbiting. Oh, you expect that in the world. Don't be surprised. But for those who've had their mind renewed, God is at work in us, put on the new, totally different. Consider Jesus, he knew no sin. No deceit was found on his lip. Can you imagine Jesus ever seeking to tear somebody down? This is self-conscious. And it should impact the way we talk to one another, even as a simple thing after this service. If you're a Christian person, it should impact the way I engage with somebody. Think of all the words we use during the week. We're twittered and tweeted, we're emailed and blogged, we're downloaded, uploaded, and completely overloaded with words. If, if there was a sort of balance with the fulcrum on the middle as, uh, is this going to build somebody up, how, how would the words balance out that we use during the week? Well, says Paul, put on the new self created in Christ Jesus after holiness and righteousness and use your language to build up to speak the truth. Emotions and anger, verse 26 and 31. Be angry, don't sin, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Seems there is a place for righteous anger but there's a proper limit to righteous anger. And isn't it easy for my torrid temper to be excused as, oh, I'm defending what's right, and somebody else's loss of control to be described as rank ungodliness? Here are some verses for the over 40s. How easy for us to be a church full of grumpy old men. And here are some verses for the under 40s. Just as easy on the football pitch, age 22. The loss of temper, of course, is a symptom of deeper pride, a desire for me to exercise my control over everything. Loss of temper indicates lack of love and respect for another person. Loss of temper betrays a deeper lack of trust in God, that he and his sovereignty will work all things out. It is the spoiled child who stamps her foot. I will scream and scream and scream until I'm sick those of you who read Just William. And we can expect the pagan world to be a place of loss of temper. Don't surprise, don't be surprised that the, the referee is surrounded by players on the football field. Of course, it's a pagan world. We can expect road, ra road rage to be the norm. I'm told that on the trading floor, physical violence is sometimes resorted to because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart, they become callous. But in the Christian culture, put it off and put on the new. God has done everything necessary for me to change. I need to make an effort. Well, finally, generosity. You can see there the thief is no longer to steal. Fascinating. One of my friends this week is working up in... Uh, 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 an inner city in the northwest, I won't name the inner city, he plays five-a-side football every Friday evening in a, a league of five-a-side football players. 
every member of the league, he tells me, is on incapacity benefit. And the mark when a person becomes a Christian, you would expect that. What do you do when you live in a pagan world where there's no God outside of yourself to control things? Oh, you live for yourself. And if you can get the benefit, you get the benefit. But the mark when God has broken into a person's life, in his little church, there on that housing estate, is that A, they stop drinking themselves stupid, and B, they stop dodging the benefits and seek work in order to be generous to others. Well, can you imagine a country like that? I, I find it impossible to imagine a country like that. Can you imagine a church like that? What a radical, radical difference. Driven not by the whip and the rod and the if you don't do that, I'll cut off your arm, enforcing legislation, but driven by the Lord Jesus. Imitate God as beloved children and walk in the love of Christ as Christ loved us. As we close then, the Christian catwalk. We've been talking about putting off and putting on. What about the Christian catwalk? How will I walk today? What will I wear today? Who will I please today? Will I do battle today? Who will I copy today? Great set of questions for those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ to be asking themselves morning by morning by morning as we head out into the world. How will I walk today? What will I wear today? Who will I please today? How will I battle today? Who will I copy today? Let's pray together. Well, we thank you, our Father, that you are at work within the people, your people, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the new creation. And we praise you for your mighty power that has defeated death and sin and that has placed the Lord Jesus Christ at the head of all creation. And we praise you that your spirit has entered into your people, brought us alive, rescued us out of this murky world. And we pray, our Father, that increasingly you would strengthen us to put off and to put on. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.